Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. Ready to get your hands dirty? Ready to start a new career? Well, coming up, we will introduce you to some people sharing the story of agriculture and giving others a brand new start in life. We'll take you to California where Armed Forces veterans are leaving conflict behind to benefit from life on the land. A Hmong community in Minnesota finds that farming gives them a connection to ethnic foods and brings a community closer together. Come along to Massachusetts where one farm school teaches students to appreciate the environment and makes them better consumers. And while we're in an educational mood, Sharon Profis steps to the head of the class for a great avocado recipe that might be perfect for dinner or entertaining. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. America's Heartland is made possible by CropLife America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KBIE to support America's Heartland programming. Contributors include the following. Close to the land. If you join us regularly on America's Heartland, you know we love to share stories that give you insights into where your food is coming from. And we've taken you cross country to meet farm and ranch families, as well as visiting programs that really tell the story of agriculture in America. And that story runs the gamut from the great work being done by the National FFA in providing opportunities for high school students to work in agriculture, to farmers in Florida and Massachusetts opening their farms to groups that harvest excess crops and make that food available to help feed the hungry. Each of these provides a hands-on experience to people who knew nothing of agriculture before. Well, we're going to share a few more with you this time, but there's a bit of a difference. They focus on programs that can dramatically change individual lives. Let's start in Southern California, where one farm experience is changing the lives of veterans. Colin and Karen Archiplay operate a small organic farm near San Diego called Archie's Acres. Our mainstay product is living basil. Uh, and that's what you see here. And what we mean by living basil is that we, we grow it in a, a soilless system. We harvest it, we have the bare root, and that stays with the plant, and that's how it goes to market. We also grow kale, avocados, uh, tomatoes. Um, bok choy. Bok choy, a few other crops, but our mainstay crop is, uh, is our living basil. That's, our, uh, that's what we're known for. Hi, Terry, it's Karen with Archie's Acres. Karen's definitely a people person, and I'm more of a hands-on type of person. Uh, and so our personalities complement each other very well. The couple decided to begin a new life in farming while Colin, a decorated Marine veteran, was on his third tour of duty in Iraq back in 2006. But despite shifting his focus to the farm after returning from the Middle East, Colin was aware of the difficulties faced by some of his fellow veterans. Colin saw that many of the soldiers with whom he'd served were struggling in their efforts to adjust to civilian life and jobs. A lot of the people he'd served with were re-enlisting, not necessarily because they wanted to, but because they couldn't find employment. And so what happened was we actually made a training program for people to do what we did. So Colin and Karen created the Veteran Sustainable Agriculture Training Program. The program provides instruction on sustainable agriculture practices. The fieldwork and plant knowledge help veterans transition to careers in the agriculture industry. If we made this small business and we're, you know, making a, a living at it, then we could do something to, to help these other people leave their service as well. Um, and so we developed a, a six-week training program, so it's full-time. 40 plus hours. And they learn about niche marketing, they learn about how to value your crop, how, what to grow. 
yeah. why you're going to choose one product over another. We cover everything. It's intense. Programs like these address some new realities in American agriculture. The growing demand for organic foods and community-supported agriculture has prompted the creation of many new small farms. In addition, an aging farm population has created a need for younger workers in both management and production positions. When you take that uniform off, nobody sees those stripes, nobody sees those decorations, and so they have to reinvent themselves. And in agriculture, you can do that. I think by focusing on agriculture, uh, we tap them into our network and hopefully that helps them feel like they're part of a unit. Then they see the mission and they feel like they're part of something greater. We're lost when we get out a lot of times. I didn't really know at all what I was doing at a, in any inclination really of where I was going to head. Former program graduates, combat veterans Ian Kersel and Justin Grimes are now employees at Archie's Acres. They know all too well the difficulties in transitioning back to civilian life. I'm doing something that's good here. I'm trying to, we're trying to do it in a responsible way to the environment and uh, to the community. So anything I can do that fosters cooperation and uh, and sharing, that's, that's what I want, that's who I am, that's what I want to be about. I like the symbiotic relationship between the plant and myself, and the more love I gave the plant, the more love it gave me and paid back to me from everything that I gave it. Because if you don't give it anything, it doesn't give you anything back. Current program students Rebecca Schwab and her husband Jacob have both seen military service. They view their training here in traditional and hydroponic farming methods as important to their new career directions. It's a lot of good knowledge, and with this, it's going to give us, you know, a better opportunity to actually um, have our own business and be su successful. And they don't just teach you about hydroponics, like they really go into soil management too, like what you need in your soil, and to sustain it and how to keep it growing, like everything very organic, mm -hmm. kind of taking it back to the basics. You know, I want to continue to serve my country, and I can't think of much more of an American story than somebody going and serving their country and then coming back and creating a small business, especially within agriculture. Did it change my life? Absolutely. If I hadn't come here, I wouldn't be doing what I am now. Um, I wouldn't have the confidence to do what I, I want to do with farming in the future, but it definitely filled a need inside me um, that wasn't filled out in the civilian world otherwise. Um, I don't feel as lost as I did is very rewarding. Here's the dirt on California dirt. The Golden State is home to more than 2,000 separate soil types, which make it possible to grow hundreds of different crops. Dirt aside, California has a lot of cows, more than one and a half million, making it the country's number one dairy state. California also leads the nation in the production of grapes, some for your table and some for those California wines. Minnesota is a prime producer in the world of agriculture. Sugar beets, wheat and soybeans are major crops. And don't forget poultry. Minnesota leads the nation when it comes to raising turkeys. But Jason Schultz says the North Star State is also home to a program that provides an agricultural start to a particular group of people. It has the look and feel of an Asian market halfway around the world, but this bustling center for food, music, and culture is in the heart of St. Paul, Minnesota. With 45,000 Hmong residents, Minnesota has one of the largest populations of Hmong in the U.S. And for people selling their goods, the Hmong Town Market is a direct connection with their cultural customers. Here at the market, you'll find traditional Hmong plants and produce. But what if these farmers could work together to expand their reach beyond the market? That's the idea behind the Minnesota Food Association's Big River Farm, about an hour northeast of St. Paul. On a warm spring weekend afternoon, you'll find Vince and his brother Tu Xiong working with their vegetable plants with big hopes for a successful season. So we kind of just planted this way. Tons of cilantro here. You got 
uh, peas, you got tomatoes, you got carrots. I got about 20 varieties of vegetables. Vince sees a big potential for farmers cooperatively working together to market their crops. A lot of farmers that grow a lot, at the end of the year, they end up throwing it away because they don't have a market or they don't know how to find a market. Because they know how to farm, but they don't know how to sell. And I, I have a background in selling and, uh, you know, I, can, I know I can get the bigger customers. And I, if I just get them to work together as a group, then we, ha we have more selling power. The Hmong American story is a poignant one. After supporting the U.S. war effort in Vietnam, much of the Hmong population found itself forced out of Laos during the communist takeover. After years in refugee camps, thousands were allowed to come to the United States. Today, Minnesota is home to a major share of the nearly 200,000 Hmong living in this country, many of whom brought farming skills with them. In their culture, it's, it's more of a, just a way to provide food for the family and maybe some trade. But since it is you know, something that they know and like, um, we're trying to help them do that as a, as a business, a way to sustain themselves and their family. She says that the big difference between what I'm doing here, I think it's more like organic uh, comparison to what she's doing. Tu Yang and his mother, Moore Yang, grow vegetables on a plot of land on the Big River organic farm. The challenges to change can be generational or cultural. It can take time and, more importantly, evidence of success to convince growers to adopt new practices. It's always a balance of of communicating um, our way, but also understanding there are many ways. And I think we have a lot to learn from other cultures as well. I know some people have had problems saying that this is too tall for them. The Minnesota Food um, Association so offers good. minority farmers really plots of ground, of disturb, along really with training classes. Really Today, farmers are sharing their techniques on we tackling weeds that invade their gardens. So, you know, I'll go along and just kind of be, have a little tension holding the handles up a little bit. Tu's weeding implement is this hoe. This is actually made by my uncle in Thailand, and he shipped it to us, so it's a like a traditional tool. It's a that, traditional hoe? Yep, that uh, Hmong people use, so. Oh, yeah, wow. this is really, this is actually unique. It's not just farming practices that combine the old and new. Alongside things like carrots and onions, you'll find traditional Asian crops. I don't know the American name or Latin name for it, but we pickle it. What's the, what's the Hmong name for it? Jopo. Jopo. And so this, this will grow up to be how big here? It's pretty small now. Uh, it, it could grow up to be about this tall. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's a leafy green. Leafy, crunchy green if you, when you pickle it. And you, so you'll pickle it and eat it year-round? Oh, yeah, yeah. In the quiet countryside, people working together to grow markets and encourage new methods. In a state with such a rich agricultural history, the truth is many Minnesotans are unaware of their neighbor Hmong American farmers. They're very quiet people, and so I think they are largely going unnoticed, and, and maybe they you know, are fine with that. You know, they're amazing people. And um, so I think it would benefit most Minnesotans to learn more about their culture and to embrace them. Minnesota is one of the top 10 wheat growing states in the nation, much of which goes into the bread, rolls, and pastries we enjoy. Speaking of which, do you like toast for breakfast? Well, the first pop-up toaster was marketed in Minneapolis, Minnesota back in 1926. The Toastmaster sold for $13.50. Education is a wonderful thing, so while we're sharing stories about people acquiring new skills in the world of agriculture, let's take a lesson from our Sharon Profis on a recipe that you can try with one of Mother Nature's most popular pieces of produce. Avocados are definitely not just for salads. I like to include them whenever I can, but one of my favorite ways to highlight them is with avocado egg rolls. It's a vegetarian take on an Asian classic, and it's a huge crowd pleaser. When you're shopping for avocados, what you want to look for is that 
It gives a little bit when you squeeze it, but it's not completely overripe. It should be a little bit firm. The thing is though that when you're shopping for them, a lot of times you either stumble upon avocados that are way too hard or overripe. So when that happens, go ahead and purchase the ones that are way too tough. Then when you take them home, put them in a paper bag with an apple or a banana and within a day or two, they'll be ready to go. For this recipe, I have four Haas avocados, which nine times out of 10 is what you'll find in the grocery store. They're really creamy and they're super good for you. Now, when you're prepping avocados, of course, the goal here is to get the skin off. And my favorite way to do that is to just first cut it in half. And if the avocado is ready, it should just come apart like that. Now for this recipe, we want to cube it. So I'll just run my knife along the flesh to create cubes. Then grab a spoon and just scoop it out. That's the easiest, fastest way to peel an avocado. Avocados are definitely the star of this dish, but we're going to add a few more ingredients to balance it out. First, I have sun-dried tomatoes. You can find these either jarred in oil, like I have here, or dehydrated, in which case you just put them in water and reconstitute them. So I'm just going to julienne them and cut them into thin strips like that before putting them in with avocados. This is gonna add a little savory element it's gonna balance really nice. And the oil is really nice here too because it'll add even more creaminess and play well with the fat content of the avocado. For a little kick of spice, we'll add a jalapeno. When you're prepping a jalapeno, if you don't wanna include the seeds, just stand it up on your cutting board and cut around the inside. The seeds will be separated and all you'll be left with is exactly what you want. We'll just cut the jalapeno into a small dice. We'll also add in about half of a red onion. And you'll see a lot of these flavors are similar to what you'd find in guacamole. Jalapenos, onions, cilantro that we'll add are classic combination. It's going to be great in these egg rolls. And finally, we'll add some cilantro. Especially when you're frying, you wanna add herbs to counterbalance the oil and the fattiness that you get from the dish. We'll add a few seasonings, a couple teaspoons of garlic powder, salt, and of course, fresh ground black pepper. As you mix the ingredients, the avocado will begin to fall apart and create a creaminess that'll bind all of these beautiful, fresh ingredients together. The filling is ready to go, so let's go ahead and fill up those egg rolls. So, just grab an egg roll wrapper with one corner facing you, then take a heaping spoonful of the filling. Now, grab the corner closest to you and fold it over the filling. Then, bring in both sides before rolling it up. And finally, I mixed an egg with a little bit of water and that'll be our glue to keep this all together. There you go, we have an egg roll. Frying the egg rolls is really simple. I've already put about a quarter inch of canola oil in a heavy bottomed pan, which is what you want when you're frying. And we'll just gently start frying our egg rolls. I'm not deep frying them to at least make this a little bit healthier. We're just waiting for the egg rolls to turn a golden brown. When you're removing these from the pan, put them on a paper grocery bag. For some reason, they end up being more crispy than if you were to drain them on a paper towel. So let's go ahead and plate them. I like to serve the avocado egg rolls with some kind of dip. In this case, I mixed sour cream, green onion, cilantro, and lime to add a little fresh kick along with those egg rolls. To serve them, I cut them in half diagonally with a sharp knife. And what that does is it lets you show off that beautiful green interior. 
and just line them up right around the dip. This dish is such a great way to show off the creaminess and richness the avocado has to offer. It's perfect for a party or whenever you're in the mood for avocados. Now what's left to do is eat. If you've never worked on a farm or ranch, it may be difficult to understand the hard work and skill set you need to succeed in agriculture. But many people do have a dream of getting back to the land. For some, it's a career change. For others, it's just a chance to have a farm experience and better understand agriculture. Our Rob Stewart says those are just some of the lessons to be learned at a very special farm school in Massachusetts. Good chicken. The chicken coop. Yeah, she can like kind of pull her neck in like that. Is the classroom at the farm Lord school in Athel, right. Massachusetts. Here, cowbells replace school bells for the 1,500 inner city kids that come here every year to learn and live real life on the farm. What kind of reaction do you see when the kids, you know, they come up and they pick up a chicken for the first time. They're from Boston, never touched a chicken. And it's fantastic. I mean, it totally freaks their package. It's a brand new world that they're op opened up to. Lily Slocum is one of 28 students from Boston taking part in the program. Would you guys like to do best with the cows? It's hands-on for this three-day field trip. <laughs> Youngsters sweep the barns, care for pregnant cows, and learn how food makes its way from farm to fork. Did you have any idea that so much went in to bringing you, you know, the food on your table and... Well, I knew that people worked for it, but it's a lot of work to do one little thing. So like one ear of corn takes so much work and it's a lot more than I thought. <laughs> Here we're not trying to train farmers, we're trying just to let children experience the beauty of a farm um, fully and feel a part of a farm fully. Um, down the road, we really are trying to give people the tools to, to farm, spend their lives farming. That down the road Ben is talking about is Maggie's farm. Ten adults taking part in a year-long program that prepares them to farm on their own. Make a big arc, you know, with your, with your arm and just throw the seeds. For 20 years, the farm school has been teaching sustainable agriculture. True to the concept of ag education, this 300-year-old farmhouse is their dorm. And this century-old barn is home to living lessons. We think of it as kind of replacing the, the family farms that are kind of disappearing all over this country. We're trying to replicate that model where uh, a, a family of parents were passing down this tradition of farming to their kids, and so that's how we, we're doing it here. A lot of weeds in here, too. Julianne Waddell gave up her life behind the desk designing high-end children's clothes and uprooted her two teenaged kids for a new slice of life. So we moved 1,300 miles away <laughs> to come have our adventure. To learn how to farm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's very important um, for everyone, but especially this next generation that's coming up, for them to understand where their food comes from and be connected to their food source. And um, I think that is, unfortunately, something that we've lost in, a, in just a very short amount of time. <laughs> Clear out all the old dead canes that have already fruited for us. That makes sense? Today, these adult students are pruning raspberry bushes in a field covered with snow. But for Julianne, a life lesson is already growing about planting seeds for a new passion and a purpose. You'll see where it all leads, and um, but I feel um, even though that this is a uh, kind of a you know it's a program where we're learning, I feel like we're doing something very important. I go to bed every night feeling like I've, I've, I've done something that is um, that's special. What is it you want people to leave here with? Um, I want them to leave here knowing that they can be effective in the world um, as farmers, as the producers of food, but also as people who can make a difference.
Before we go, just a reminder to spend some time at our Heartland website. That's americasheartland.org. Video from all of our shows, lots of great recipes from Sharon. And remember to check us out at some of your favorite social media sites as well. Thanks for traveling the country with us. We'll see you next time on America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man In America's heartland Living close to the land There's a love for the country And a pride in the brand In America's heartland Living close Close to the land America's Heartland is made possible by Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KVIE to support America's Heartland programming. Contributors include the following.